one thing that I can like pinpoint at and say that thing has actually helped me uh, get to where I'm at today is a positive attitude in situations when when sometimes the situation does not call for it. Um, when I'm faced with a huge obstacle, which I've had plenty of over time, um, I always try to find the crack in the wall. Like, where is the crack where I can sit, see a little bit of light? Um, and try to follow that crack and try to follow the light. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Look Up with Mark Weinstein. That's me. I'm your host. This is episode 14, and we just keep chugging along. Uh, My goal is to bring you an episode every week uh, for the next however many weeks I keep doing this, and it's been really fun so far. I'm super appreciative of all of you for listening along, and to be frank, it's just fun for me. Um, I've been meeting so many incredible people And this is uh, no exception. Uh, In this episode, I had the privilege of speaking to Christopher Ategeka. Uh, Christopher has had an incredible journey in life. He was born into extreme poverty in rural Uganda. Uh, Both of his parents died before he was 10 years old, leaving him and his four younger siblings to fend for themselves. But he was accepted into an orphanage and later adopted by an American family who paid for him to go to college. He came to the U.S. and graduated from Berkeley with a degree in mechanical engineering. He's now an award-winning entrepreneur and engineer, the founder and CEO at UCOT, the Unintended Consequences of Technology Foundation, a company that has created a unique model to support and fund early-stage startups, creating solutions to unintended and willfully ignored consequences of modern tech. His conference, UCOT Forum, creates a space to host authentic discussions around exponential technology development and usage that may not be serving humanity's best interests. So for those of you that have been listening, you can understand why I wanted to speak with him. Prior to UCOT, Chris founded Hourglass Ventures, which invests in early-stage companies to support visionary entrepreneurs from the African continent who come from underprivileged backgrounds. He also founded Health Access Corps, a social enterprise that works to establish sustainable healthcare systems on the African continent. He was most recently honored by the World Economic Forum as a young global leader. He's now dedicating his life to battle the unintended consequences of technology because he believes that tech is evolving so rapidly that we can't even perceive some of the potential outcomes from this development, and it might end poorly for us all. So on this episode, we dive into that. We discuss Chris's journey from Africa to the US to starting his first business. We talk about the startup ecosystem in Africa and the rapidly evolving tech landscape in the US. Chris shares his PIMP framework, Power, Influence, Money, and Politics, which is a framework for how he perceives important decisions are made across the globe, whether we like it or not. We talk about optimism and practicality, and Chris explains to me how he believes large-scale changes can be practically executed. As always, I learned a lot from this episode, not to mention I was extremely inspired by his story, and I hope that you are too. So without further ado, this is Christopher Ategeka. Christopher Atageka, thank you for coming on the Look Up podcast. I'm super excited to have you on here. Um, I really appreciate you, you know, again, taking the time, even though you haven't heard one of the episodes yet. Um, hopefully after this, you'll it'll pique your interest and you'll get to check one or two of them out. But thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So I guess, you know, in, in kind of doing a little bit of research about you and your background, um, I learned quite a bit about your story. And I think, you know, I don't often start with my guest background, but I think that you 
come from such a unique perspective, um, you know, that's really shaped who you are. And I would love if you could share a little bit with, with the listeners about your journey and, and kind of where you started and, and how you've gotten to where you are today. Well, um, again, thanks for having me. I, I'm one of those people who, you know, I've, um, I find myself, I, I say I'm an engineer and I'm an entrepreneur by necessity. Uh, I never really set out to want or, you know, go and be an entrepreneur, but it's just the things and the world I've experienced over time um, got me to be, you know, if not me, then who kind of mindset. Um, so I grew up in, in Uganda and through many, many, many life events that we can get into, I ended up in America. I went to engineering school at Berkeley. Um, and when I finished engineering school, I founded a few companies and my current effort uh, with my company, UCOT, um, and by the way, UCOT stands for Unintended Consequences of Technologies. And at UCOT, we have primarily two areas of focus and, and interest. Um, the first area is to focus primarily on uh, trying to get a lot of people, uh, you know, building a community around this giant topic of unintended consequences because majority of people are focused on looking how we can get technology out into the world, how we get flying cars into space, how we get self-driving cars into the streets. Um, but then, you know, as you probably have, have gotten into with your guests in the past, you know, we have all these many unintended consequences uh, from you know, fake news and data breaches and election integrity and biases and all those things that we need to pay attention to, but there isn't a unified movement that's actually looking at this. A lot of people are working in silos to contribute um, a little bit of their part, but for me, I decided to form UCOT as a unified effort to work with you know, policymakers and researchers and policy science and uh, policymakers and scientists um, and entrepreneurs to create solutions. So, yeah. So, in short, UCOT has two efforts. One is the let's create a movement, let's have a conversation around these things. And the second effort is let's actually create solutions because everybody can stand on a podium and tell you the house is on fire, but what are you doing about it? Absolutely. And thank you for, for sharing that. I think it's, uh, it's definitely important to just, A, first raise awareness for these unintended consequences. And then also, you know, you take it a step further and actually take action. Um, something that I've heard you say in the past is that talent is universal, but opportunities are not. And I thought that that's really, that really resonated with me. Um, you know, when I talk about a lot of, a lot of things on this show, it's often kind of these these quote unquote, like first world problems, right? Like the unintended co consequences of social media addiction or, you know, um, Cambridge Analytica on elections and things like that, which I guess is more than just a first world problem. It's everywhere now, but you know, you, you briefly touched on your background, but coming, coming up in Uganda, you experienced, you know, I think something beyond a bit beyond that, where you understand that the techno that the power that technology can have to help people come with talent like yourself, you know, gain access to opportunities. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your, you know, your upbringing and, and specifically like how you got to the U S I think that'd be really important for the listeners who aren't familiar with you to understand and how it makes you uniquely positioned to be working on what you're working on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, um, um, I'm a product of uh, someone else's generosity. And I'm also a product of like really what is good about our humanity um, and technology played a role. Um, so just to be clear, I am not anti-technology. I'm just a pragmatic person who thinks that technology is a double-edged sword 
that technology it can be used for good, it can be used for bad. And I am a living testimony of how technology can be used for good. But And I've also used technology in my own work to showcase uh, how humanity can, um, can be good to each other. And then along the way, I realize uh, the other side, the elephant in the room, the dark side, and I figured I uh, needed to do something about that. So how, is, uh, how am I a product of technology and how am I a product of someone else's generosity? Um, when I was uh, growing up, I, I was um, just right at the beginning. I was born in a very, very rural village. I wore my first pair of shoes when I was about 17. And that is kind of came from the fact that when my parents died, when I was around seven or eight, um, they, you know, we didn't have much. Uh, I spiraled into this extreme poverty and everything that comes with it, uh, you know, homelessness and disease and, and all the, you know, glory of being poor in, in, in a developing country. And, when that happened, um, I didn't have a whole lot of hope until uh, when I was about 15 and someone told me about a program that it helps an orphan. It's just one of those save an orphan type of programs. And um, I went over there and they applied um, and they got accepted. But there is an element of you know, a little bit of, of, of the old technology that was involved, the, the, the letter writing and the emails that had to be sent in order for me to get hooked up with this opportunity. So they eventually sent me to school. And when I was about, um, about 21, uh, uh, six years into the program, they, I finished high school and they did really well. And the program offered to send me to school in America. Now, that is not a very typical, a very common thing that you see uh, through this specific program because uh, they had about 500 kids. I was one of the 500 and they do that every year and they still do it to this day. Um, that was, I was lucky. I was just lucky and, and uh, there were a lot of other uh, interesting individuals um, who have not been as lucky as I have. Um, and, you know, anyway, long story short, I end up in America. I went to engineering school at Berkeley and undergrad and graduate school. I did mechanical engineering. And when I finished that, I founded my first company. And the first company was also using technology to help individuals in my rural village access healthcare. Um, and it worked very well. We helped many, many people. Uh, so I saw the goodness of technology from my own personal experience and using technology to help others who are in need. And then along the way, that's when I kind of came in touch with the dark side of it and decided to shift my focus to the other side. And I guess, you know, I th thank you for sharing that. I, I I want to say like, you know, having, I, I recently visited for my, for the first time I visited Sub-Saharan Africa, I went to um, Senegal and I drove out eight hours from Dakar into, um, you know, rural villages. And it's, it's incredible that, you know, it, even in those villages, the access to mobile phones is still, is so prevalent, even though there's extreme poverty there, but there seems to be such low hanging fruit um, from a technological standpoint to help um, residents of rural, you know, villages in Africa. And what's interesting to me is, you know, that's how you started, right? And something must have triggered you, something, um, you know, really meaningful to, to focus on the negative consequences of technology when it does seem like there's, especially for your native country, um, there's so much opportunity for tech to, to do good. So I'm curious, you know, 
if you could walk me through a little bit more the first company that you worked on, how that panned out. And then really, if there was if there was a specific trigger that led you to say, wow, like tech has incredible power for good, but can also be, you know, can also be extremely negative and led you yeah. on this next step in your journey. Oh, absolutely. So when I was, um, so my first company was building um, uh, products to bring healthcare access uh, to individuals who don't need it and who, who do need it. Where, where that came from is that my parents, both my parents died due to lack of access to healthcare. I lost a brother due to lack of access to healthcare. So I saw how lack of access can um, cause a lot of pain and causing it in my own life and my family and the community around me. So when I finished engineering school, I wanted to use my engineering talent to create products or services that can um, actually ease some of this pain. So we created ambulances and mobile clinics. These are like vehicles on wheels now, like a hospital on wheels. Uh, we would go out and serve people in the villages. Um, and we also created a product that can do diagnosis uh, in the villages that without a need of electricity um, because electricity is a big problem in some of these parts. Um, and all this is applying technology to help individuals in rural area access healthcare. And it worked very well. Uh, we, it was a very successful a program and company and um so while doing that it garnered a lot of attention uh from major media and uh, winning awards and fellowships and what happens is that while doing that i find myself in these like very interesting circles uh like the world economic forum and the un and, and speaking at ted um all these interesting communities where amazing people like world leaders and shakers are doing great things with technology to make the world a better place, efficient, better, faster, novel. Um, but to me personally, every time I walked in that room, I would hear too much optimism and very minimal uh, pragmatism where you are creating a technology and when you ask you know what could possibly go wrong most of the time the answer is like well we created the technology we can reverse engineer it and uh, it won't have the negative effect as you think um so i was uh, uh one specific moment i was at, at ted and it was one very charismatic speaker who talked about deep fakes and how we can use, um, you know, and kind of like the idea was coming from a, a very interesting place where they thought we can create someone's face um, who has either passed on or no longer with us. And, you know, can you imagine if your grandma can read to you your favorite bedtime story and you can see them do it in real, in real time and you can see their image and you see their lips move? Um, and that was an, an amazing thought of creating a, a product that can do that. By the same time, it was kind of like the beginning of the genesis of this thing called deep fakes. Um, and then that same person was asked, you know, like, where could this possibly go wrong? And they're like, well, we, we created a technology. We know where we can reverse engineer it and not have a, a bigger um a bigger problem or a bigger impact on society. Um, and at the same time, they were saying that, um, you know, this technology uh, is, is, is a double-edged sword. So they created it and it's all, it's not in their control to be able to, you know, force people to use it one way or another. Um, to me, I felt like there wasn't a sufficient answer to think through the many, many, many unintended consequences. And I went home feeling kind of like helpless, but at the same time I was like, okay, I'm gonna do a little bit of research and try to see who else is doing something in this field. And it turns out there is a handful of people working in silos on different topical areas. So biases in AI, 
Um, mm. You can talk about issues in the, you know, uh, democracy tech. You can talk about issues in, you know, the, the genetic engineering field. So there's a lot of good that could happen. But at the same time, there's a lot of bad that it's happening. But there isn't a whole lot of, of the bad because there's not a there's n- not too many people has, have focused on figuring out how you use the forces of demand and supply to solve these problems as they come up. Or as humans, we normally like to use our monkey brain of thinking is like you know fix it when it breaks or you get scared and you run versus kind of like thinking through things ahead of time and try to mitigate uh, unintended consequences before they happen. Yeah, so people tend to be mostly reactive. And as we see with climate change, you know, and potentially with artificial general general intelligence, you know, we are not being proactive in trying to you know, resolve these issues. It's more like, we'll figure it out when it's too, by the time it's too late. Yep. And that's and something that the, you saw. It's, it's the idea that everybody, it's all about the now, right? And when you think about um, the, the reactive is, you know, an earthquake happens, you jump, right? But when you're told, you know, in the next 30 years and next 50 years, uh, we may not have any world left to play on, you're like, well, show me. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and that's not a, a good mindset for us to have as a human species because uh, everything we're doing right now is destroying our world and in, it can end up destroying who we are as a species. Well, the world will be here in one form or another. Whether humanity will be here, that's a whole other question. So... Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, an important question to think about. Um, so how is, um, I, there's so many things because, uh, you know, we started with your healthcare company in Africa. I'm just curious, like, what was your experience um, as a founder and entrepreneur building a company that was working on seemingly an altruistic mission, um, but most investors are looking for kind of that, like, that blitz scale, kind of high ROI, high return on investment type of opportunity what was your experience in the Valley trying to raise capital or was it a nonprofit organization? You know, how did you structure it? What was that experience like? Are we talking about the old healthcare or the UCOT? <clears throat> the, the old healthcare company. And we'll definitely get to UCOT, but I feel like you had such a unique experience with that, that I, I want to dig in a little bit further there. Oh yeah. So the healthcare company, uh, initially the, the, the product one, the ambulance and, Mobile Clinics was a nonprofit. Um, mm-hmm. We raise grants and we go out there and serve populations. Um, and I shifted and accredited B Corporation, which was uh, a for profit entity creating a product. Um, you know, think of it as a, like a pregnancy test, but equivalent for like malaria and HIV for rural areas in, in mm. Africa. That was a for profit. So it had a, a good value proposition that investors could see and bite into. Um, yeah. And then moved on and, and doing this UCAT. And who were the buyers of the, of that technology? Like who were, who were you were using them? And I guess, um, did you did you find it was easy? I mean, it's never easy, but did you find as an entrepreneur, it was ex- even more challenging to get recognized by VCs and others that would finance a for-profit business like that because, you know, maybe the business model is a little bit challenging or, or you know, what was that experience like? I mean, it is always challenging. No business is easy. <laughs> Everybody yeah. is looking for... Uh, they are returning the investment, and when you create a product um, like we we had created, um, you you kind of go and try to find the demand pool. Uh, who is the people? Who is the group that care about the population you try to serve? And those are the they're the ones who become your your customers. So, in the developing world context most of the time you find that the poor people you want to serve actually don't have the buying power um Mm. but there is populations there's individuals who um 
care about them receiving health care. It could be a politician, it could be a government, it could be these international NGOs. Um, those are the ones that become your, your customers, and then you become a distributor of some sort. And uh, that's kind of how you look at it. Got it. And, and in Africa right now, you know, with, again, so much, still so much poverty, um, still lack a lot of lack of access. And I know it's improving. And, you know, if you, if you look at, I think, um, I th- believe Ethiopia has a really um, progressive tech scene on the rise, but like, what's the, is there, is there kind of room for private enterprise to solve these really um, hard problems or is it something that still needs to be done in partnership with, you know, private public partnerships? Or is it something that really needs to be covered by nonprofits in the public sector? I mean, it's no, like healthcare in Africa. Oh yeah, no. I, I right now Africa is one. It has a few countries that are the fastest growing countries in the world. Uh, Rwanda is in that the category, and 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 uh, Nigeria. Uh, so Nigeria, Ghana. Uh, Kenya, uh, obviously South Africa, there is a huge tech scene and, you know, you can, you've seen or heard about some of the uh, giant tech companies that are popping out of there, like the Amazon of Africa, there's a company called Jumia that literally went IPL uh, here in, in, in America and, and it tabled the African market. Uh, no, with the rise of uh, cell phones, as you uh, rightfully pointed out at the beginning, is that people are leapfrogging and um, the old ways of like a wired telephone into your house. You're just going straight to mobile. And that has created a giant platform for people to be able to build on and create different technologies that can solve the Africa's problems. And um in East Africa, there is uh, M-Pesa, there is uh, uh, MTN Mobile Money, and uh, Nigeria has its version mm-hmm. of that. And this is kind of like uh, uh, mobile banking. And, and that, what that, that has done is kind of like unlocked opportunities for people who don't have credit cards or don't even have credit uh, they, to be able to... Um, you know, be able to transact and, and, and be able to pay uh, if, let's say, there was an app or some technology that's coming in to solve some problem, people can use their, this mobile money as a way of, trans, of carrying out transactions, which was a huge hindrance in the past. Because in America, mm. as you can imagine, we have, you know, you have a credit score, you have a, some sort of like... A, Government issued ID, right? Yeah, government issued ID, you have an address and people can send like, you know, most parts of, of Africa, people are still, uh, you know, these infrastructures are not as developed and people have to be like, oh, you go down the street, you see a mango tree and you take a left, you see a car <laughs> and you go to my house. So you can't use that in an Amazon right style to deliver a package. <laughs> you tell a drone, when you see a mango, that's my house. Uh, and, and, and this is an overly gross generalization, but of course there's uh, cities and many towns in Africa that are very, very developed and they have uh, addresses and people have credit cards, but majority of the continent is still growing and people are leapfrogging because of cell phones. So, you know, there's so much opportunity there. Um, and you're, you're still based in the Valley, right? You're up in San Francisco area in the Bay area. That's correct. Yeah. Do you have any intention of, of going back to Uganda and continuing to develop startup opportunities there? Or do you see yourself staying here in the future? There's only one me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as you know very well time is our most valuable resource and um, you have to maximize um, you know where you can uh, where the, the opportunities are best in your interest and they're you know best to the interest of the world so to me I do have businesses and opportunities still going on in in Uganda, but I am not as involved as I used to be, like personally and physically. Um, and that's because the Valley has uh, bigger opportunities and I can work on things that are on a global scale. And um, my level of ambition as a person has increased from originally thinking, oh, I can help one person in my village. 
and I now be success and that has been for me but then over time I realized like I have this uh, ability talent network that I can build something that's for the world and Uganda is part of the world and, uh, and that's where I'm focusing my energy right now but as as you mentioned I, I it's in my home country and and Africa is the continent uh, my home continent so I will still and always be involved in the, in the past I created a a fund and the fund was called uh, Hourglass, Hourglass Ventures, Ventures yeah. and that was primarily to focus on individuals who have a great ideas, come from the continent, but don't have that friends and family around to get the ideas off the ground. And that is another way of getting involved, but not physically involved, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's so interesting to me because I think it speaks to Given, given your background, given kind of how far you've come from, you know, being um, orphaned in Uganda, coming and studying at Berkeley, building this incredible company to bring healthcare, you know, to rural rural villages in Uganda, and and you know this venture fund and all of this, you know, incredible opportunity that must be around you at all times. These awards that you've won, speaking engagements to the World Economic Forum and TED, and all these things that you've consciously decided that the unintended consequences of the technology that's being built is where you think you can have the most impact. To me, that speaks volumes about really just how deep these these potential problems, which you refer to as the dark side of technology, are. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show, you know, to talk about what are those kind of, what is the dark side of technology as you perceive it? What are kind of the biggest threats and therefore opportunities that need to be resolved? And how do you, how do you see kind of things shaking out today um, as far as kind of these un, unintended consequences growing? Yeah, so <clears throat> for the most part, um, for the, the, a one one thing that I can like pinpoint at and say that thing has actually helped me uh, get to where I'm at today is a positive attitude in situations when when sometimes a situation does not call for it. Um, when I'm faced with a huge obstacle, which I've had plenty of over time, um, I always try to find the crack in the wall. Like, where is the crack where I can sit, see a little bit of light um, and try to follow that crack and try to follow the light? Um, there, if there is any form of uh, some sort of a disturbance when society is kind of thrown off track, um, uh, natural disasters are a good example. Uh, when natural disasters happen, electricity is out, water is out, people are in panic. Um, Sometimes uh, that situation calls for paralysis. People really don't know what to do. Um, and other times it, you know, it gets you or fight and flight mode you need to do something here. Um, if you're able to figure out to reorient and reorganize people in that situation, you know, no electricity, no water. If you can figure out to bring people back to its normal cohesion, then you can you have a have a great business opportunity. Uh, do I make sense? Yeah, you broke you broke up a little bit there, but I, so, I maybe ex expand on that a little bit more. So, um, if an, if a hurricane happens and an earthquake happens and people are thrown off track and there's no mm. clean drinking water and hospitals are out, if you're able to figure out how to bring those systems back in place. That is a good business opportunity. And, and, and that's what I mentioned earlier that for me, I'm always looking for a crack in the wall where you can see the light when those situations are happening. And that's exactly what's happening with technology, where we have um, amazing, amazing opportunities of where technology is making our lives better, easier, efficient, faster. Um, but then there's this other dark side that not too many people are paying attention to because one it's not that interesting that not sexy uh people always want to be optimistic 
on the positive side. And for me, what makes me excited, because I've seen it over and over again, is when a wall is placed in front of you, you always want to try to find that crack. And that's kind of what got me excited about the unintended consequences. So there is plenty of unintended consequences. Um, and to me, the two most important ones that you know I think we are not having enough conversations about, and mm. they are the most terrifying that have the ability to literally wipe out humanity are two things. And I'm t- here I'm talking about speed. Um, climate change is one of the biggest issues, but it's a, it's kind of like a drawn out issue that a lot of mm. people don't, uh, they want to see it happen before they can react to it. Uh, and it's happening in our eyes. They're like, no, 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 that's just like, you know, if a flooding happens, like, well, we've, we've not seen that before, but it's not a big deal. And then they move on with their lives. So climate change is down the road. So I'll call that one like number three. So the mm. two things that are very, very important that all of us and the world needs to be really paying attention to right now the most are the artificial intelligence, the, the rise of the general artificial intelligence. And the number two is the genetic engineering. So these two technologies have tremendous, tremendous impact in the positive direction to make humanity a better experience. However, the same, same technology in the wrong hands has the ability to wipe us all out. And that is very important because if some, you know, a lot of people, some people may say, well, that is fear mongering. Um, to me, I don't think that's fear mongering. I think it's uh, it's called safety engineering, where you need every time you know if you go to IKEA and you're buying a uh, a, a shelf you're gonna put together, um, it comes with instructions. I, even if as small or as stupid this shelf is, it comes with instructions on how to put it together well and not hurt yourself. When you look at how genetic engineering and AI is getting developed today, there's no specification. Like everyone is going their own direction. The people with the most amount of data and the most amount of uh, money are the ones doing the development. Regulations Mm. are out there because the politicians don't even understand what's getting developed. They can't keep up, yeah. They can't keep up, it's too fast. And so imagine you're building something that has the ability to become a bomb, but you're like, We'll see what happens. Uh, and that's kind of what, the mo- you know, some of the things are very terrifying. So gene editing and artificial general intelligence should scare all of us, but we shouldn't be paralyzed. We should figure out what we do about those problems and mitigate them before they happen. And the third one is it, like what I call the closed third is climate change. But like I said, mm. climate change is important. It is one of the biggest challenges of our time. But because it's stretched out, you know, taking 50, 100 years, a lot of people are kind of like, well, even though, wait and see. <laughs> yeah, even though there are some scientists out there who think that we've already passed the tipping point. And yeah. so yeah. we'll see what happens with that. But I've also seen you mention some talks you talk about kind of data privacy as well. And that's something that I focused on a lot on this show. Um, you know, I think now that's much more in the public sphere because of what happened with Cambridge Analytica and the way that our personal data has been weaponized to manipulate um, election outcomes and to create tribalism and things like that. Is there anything else that you want to touch on there um, or on data privacy? Um, yeah. Data privacy right now is a, it's, it's considered a Western luxury. Mm. Uh, where, where people in the West are kind of like concerned about data privacy because, uh, as you say, I think it's a privilege to even think about your data as uh, a problem um, because mm. the majority of the world, they have far more other pressing issues that they yes, are privacy okay. is the least thing they wanna, they're thinking about. However, that's not to downplay the importance and uh, the, the urgency of the problem. Um, so to me, I feel like there is a, 
a huge um, America recently fell behind on being the leader in development in the telecom, uh, the telecom industry. And that's why you see the 5G battle going on between the United States and, and China. Um, mm. The reason they fell behind because of the policies and not being able to keep up as, as fast as they could with the other, uh, it's with China and the other countries that, you know, developed a certain technology in the 4G and 5G space. That you can see it playing out exactly the same way right now in AI development and data. So mm. with AI is that America and Europe, especially Europe has the GDPR um, and, and the GDPR rules are um, a kind of like extremely the, difficult for data extremely company. difficult to collect data and use data in the development of these new technologies. And now what's happening is countries like China and others who, you know, privacy is not the thing. It's not, it's like not even the thing in the people have to think about because they, they have far more other issues to think about. Um, mm. They're collecting every single data on their citizens. And they're using that as training data for their new technologies, which means they are going to be leaps and bounds ahead of the countries that are overly regulating on their on the data part. So, on, the, on, the, on that on that note, though, I mean, do we want you know, and specifically carrying this back towards what you're doing with UCOT, you know, like to me, Europe is Europe is taking the lead in instilling the value of you know, the right to permission your own data, which should be, in my opinion, a universal right. And like, I want, I want those values to be, you know, fundamental, fundamental building blocks of the technology that we're creating. But what you're, what I'm hearing from you is, you know, there is a, 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 almost like a lesser of two evils choice Maybe you, you didn't describe China, you know, what China's doing is evil necessarily, but, you know, they're, they're leaps and bounds ahead. I see this with, um, with Facebook's Libra coin launch. You know, they launched Facebook for listeners that aren't familiar, launched their own cryptocurrency um, called Libra. There was a whole hearing in the U.S. Um, Congress and Senate about Libra coin and if it was good or bad for for um, users, you know, obviously onboarding two and a half billion Facebook users worldwide to a new digital currency. And I think one of the arguments that David Marcus made that was the most um, striking for the congressman was it's either us or you're going to end up in a world where you have no regulatory control over, a, you know, a digital currency that's created and managed by the Chinese government is kind of the, the sense that I got from Facebook. And so now you're left we're left with this almost like, um, what's the classic problem where you just have to have to choose the lesser of two evils? Is that so, is that how you feel about how you feel about kind of AI training and you know um, uh, synthetic biology as well? Or yeah, no. So I, I, like I mentioned at the beginning, I'm very very cautious of playing on the two extremes mm. because. The world is, um, a lot of people tend to box the world and be, um, it's either good or either bad. So it's like this very binary way of looking at things. And uh, I think it's very dangerous. And the reason it's dangerous is because the world is not black and white. It's a spectrum. There is uh, obviously there's extremes on the good and there's extremes on the bad, but most of the world, if you look at it, and you and I can probably agree on this, that it operates in the gray zone. And that's why yes. I like to be very pragmatic about my approaches to things and not feel like I need to fall in one extreme over the other extreme. So what I was saying is there is that, you know, uh, GDPR is a fantastic thing. It's trying to get us to figure out how we can regulate uh, technologies and access to our data and have freedom to say who uses our data or not. However, what I'm saying is that this approach of using the old industrial rules or the old regulatory style rules 
has created um, a, an environment where, and, and by old industrial rules, I mean in the past, if you, if, mm. for example, if you wanted to go to the moon, um, you'd had to introduce a legislation in, in Congress or in some political body, and then the political body would vote and say, oh, we want to go to the moon. And then when they say we're going to the moon, they say, okay, let's go to the moon. And then you got to come up with a budget. And then they go, okay, the budget is good. Let's go to the moon. And then you end up going to the moon. And there's uh-huh. steps involved for you to go to the moon. Today, the way technology uh-huh. is getting developed, no one is going to Congress ask for permission to go to mm-hmm. the moon. People are literally, you know, and figuratively, <laughs> and literally creating their own entities to go to Mars with mm-hmm. no one <laughs> because they can fund it with themselves. They have enough data. They have enough engineer, engineers, so they don't need your permission to go to Mars. Um, mm. And that is where we need to pay more attention to the idea that the playing field has changed and we can't control it the old way we used to and we need to figure out new ways and if I had all the answers, I would be very rich right now. So <laughs> it's an open <laughs> conversation. <laughs> so how are you, you know, let's going back to kind of the problems that you mentioned, general artificial intelligence being one of them. And this, again, for listeners that aren't familiar with this concept, I think just defining it is important. This is um, if an artificial intelligence or a digital consciousness were to surpass the intellectual capacity of a human, um, there is a theory that holds that the, um, this machine would, would grow exponentially in its abilities and intelligence beyond what humans could understand and thus would, would reach some kind of escape velocity beyond our own control, our ability to control it. So I guess with, with this particular problem, Chris, like what is something that you caught is doing or, or proposing um, to try to counter, you know, the, the runaway um, consequences of, of something like algorithms go, running amok, like the classic uh, paperclip, you know, problem? Um, you know, so we are a very, we have a very, very tiny drop in the bigger picture of things. Uh, I don't think as a company or as a government or as a country, there is any single body that has all the answers, nor has all the solutions to this massive problem because it's a huge, huge problem. And it's a huge opportunity too. So people are developing the technologies, you know, kind of looking at, you know, how can we be leaders uh, both financially in power, like I call it pimp. It's, it's, it's money and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, power, it's influence and politics. Um, mm. that, that kind of like those four <laughs> things are kind of like the, that, that the ones kind of keep the forces going the direction that things are going. Um, and I don't know if I actually even think I, I did it wrong. So it's pimp, it's, it's power. power. Influence, money, politics. And politics, exactly. Those those four uh, are the ones that drive the, the things in the direction that are growing. So, so long as there's money to be made, there's somebody who is going to keep developing a technology in some direction. And investors uh, encourage this. Uh, the, the individuals who are developing technology, they want to win. They want to be on top of the world. They want Their army needs to be on top of the world so they can keep the control. So for us as a small company, all we can do at least at this point is to counter on the specific issues as they go out of hand or try to come up with thoughts and ideas on things that actually up and coming that we are you know, we know they're going to happen, but we don't know what's going to actually transpire. So from the things already happening, so we can look at fake news and data breaches and create some uh, product that's going to respond to tell you this is a fake article or with a data breach, we can create a security tool. So that's responding directly to things already going wrong. But on the things that are proactive, 
a good example is um, you look at uh, self-driving cars. So every major company is investing a lot of money on trying to get a self-driving car in the street. And it's a race. It's an arms race. People want to be the first to get it on the street because there's a lot of money to be made to win that race. Um, and very a lot of conversation is being had, but very little action is getting taken on what that disruption looks like. So you get cars on the street. What happens to the vehicles that are already on the street right now? There needs to be a transition from the old to the new. Huge opportunity. But we need to figure out how you go about that. There is uh, the idea of the you know, current drivers uh, who are using driving as actually a profession. I think which it's, is the, the, it's the number one profession, I think, in the United it's States. The number one profession. It's, you know, 29 states, I think, uh, where driving is the number one job. Uh, how about the service industry uh, where, you know, that is also employing plenty of people and it's getting automated. So we know some of these things are coming. It's not, a, it's not an if, it's actually when. And the question is, how can we better prepare and, and create products, services to do that transition in the most efficient way possible. Uh, so that's how we look at issues, either responding or being proactive on the problems. But we don't have like the giant bigger picture answers or like how are we going to stop AI from taking over the world yeah. uh, beyond our resources and ability. That makes sense. So you can <clears throat> pick smaller kind of sub issues within these yeah. two broader categories, potentially three if you include climate change and try to create technology that can counter some of those consequences or, or create you know, cutting edge thinking around how those technologies should be developed with what values or what, you know, processes to make sure that they're safe and that we minimize unintended consequences. Exactly. Yes. I would say, you know, it's interesting to me because I spoke to a gentleman named Douglas Rushkoff on a previous episode and he talks about the techno humanists, mm. you know, gentlemen like, um, like Tristan, Tristan Harris, who I'd love to have on the show who started the center for humane technology you know, those for whom the answer to um, these unintended consequences is more tech. And I guess my question for you is, you know, using tech to solve tech consequences, is that kind of just like a never ending game of whack-a-mole where, you know, you solve one consequence with one technology and then a new one pops up and then you solve that one and another one pops up and we're constantly just like plugging holes in the dam with our fingers while the whole dam, as you mentioned, these cracks is cracking open because the foundation, the structural piece is broken already. Like, can you talk to me about that? And, you know, as you said, you're an optimist, so maybe that's too pessimistic of a view. No, it's... Uh, uh, so we have to, uh, when, when humans are faced, <clears throat> when humans are for, uh, faced with a lot of overwhelm, what happens is uh, there are two ways uh, to react. The first way is, to, uh, is paralysis. And that's where most people actually are. It's like climate change, that's too big. I don't know what's one person what I can do. Um, the plastics in the ocean. By 2050, there'll be more plastics in the ocean than fish. I don't know. I don't know what I can do as one person. And yet we know for sure that you need to crawl before you walk and you walk before you run and run before you fly. You need to take a step. Otherwise you will be paralyzed. So to your point and to your question that, you know, at this never ending game of using technology to solve technology problems, you got to fight fire with fire. Otherwise you will be paralyzed and not do anything about it because the alternatives are worse. Like, so you choose either to stop and not do anything or you do something and maybe that something can have a positive impact well, to society. Hopefully. What I would say, I guess just to like clarify there, I hear you, but I think what, what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, you're fighting fire with fire, but perhaps it's better to fight, you know, fire with water or, you know, to do some clearing of the brush so that there isn't a large scale forest fire. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that. Um, 
you you used an incredible you created your own framework right for the fundamental drivers behind the rapid progress in technology that is is not considering these consequences pimp power influence money politics right what if instead of you know trying to go after the effects which are these unintended consequences we went and changed these fa- to try to change one of or or all four of these foundational um, you know, maybe consciousness or psychological issues that that really challenge the human condition. Like, what if we change the very systems themselves that have evolved this kind of perverse um, short term thinking? You know, what if it were we somehow were to create a system where we're worrying about power, money, and influence, or are those just fundamental human nature elements that? you know, we, we maybe are also too big to try to solve. Remember I told you that I, I, I tried to avoid playing in the extremes. <clears throat> yes. And, and, and avoid kind of falling one side over the other and avoid to look at life as a black and white. Um, it's because it's not either or. It's not like, oh, we just focus on using technology to fight technology and that's all we do. We need to focus, focus on policy we need to focus on the capitalism. We need to focus on uh, the fundamentals of society and what makes us human. Uh, so if we go back to that PIMP acronym, is that um, you and I are not powerful enough, man. Everything good or bad in this world is run by money. Everything from politics, politicians are bought into office and they get to vote on the policies that their buyers are telling them to vote on to money to be made. You know, if, if you look at capitalism, the way it stands today, so long as there's money to be made, fix it when it breaks. So if this goes, you know, a trillion towards those forces and you and I are coming with our signs saying, hey, we need to change the <laughs> fabric of society and, and all we are doing is holding signs, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So we need to figure out how we embed our forces in that system so that we can change it from within. Because the reality is, so long as there might to be made, things are going to go the direction that the people, especially a handful of people who have the money, want them to go. And you and I can... So I I have this theory that change law large scale change happens in two ways and both ways involve a rich person. Are you ready? (laughs) Two ways. Yes, I'm ready. First way is you provide value to the rich person and then they will support you. So a good example, I'll create a product and I come to a rich person and say, Hey, I've created the best phone the world has ever seen. Give me your money. I'll be rich. You'll be rich. The world have a lot of phones. Let's work together. That's mm-hmm. the majority of capitalism. And that's how it works and that's how change happens, how Apple has changed the world, how all these giant companies have changed the world. The other way is you become a thorn in the rib of the rich person. Are you following? Yes. So you're either going to provide value or you provide, you are a thorn. And when you're a thorn, like they go to bed, it hurts. They sit on the couch, they can't ignore it. That's another form of change. The sad reality is when you become a thorn, somebody more often than not has to die before the actual change can happen. So you've seen all these giant movements, a million kids walk on Washington, D.C. trying to, have some change in policy on gun violence right now steal crickets why because there's someone more powerful with more money that, that is setting the agenda and setting the direction where things are that you and i don't have enough money and nor enough power to kind of say oh we're going to go and change the system part of it uh because there's a with a pimp there's a lot of force going against us if that makes sense yeah i hear you that make that makes sense i think i think that's fair you know and i've always kind of had this i've always been on in of two minds on 
some of these things. You know, one is you have to you have to play the game that you're you presented with, and only once you beat that game can you then change the game and level up. So, you know, one example of that is if the game is scored and measured by the amount of wealth that you generate, then start a big company, make a lot of money, prove that you can beat that game, and then go ahead and say, okay, like that game was interesting, but now I'm going to create a new game. And that new game is a real billionaire, someone that impacts positively a billion people, not someone that makes a billion dollars, and go out and try to establish that framework. The other is to just remove yourself from the game entirely and say, I'm not willing to play the game of capitalism. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't, and, and create a, a separate game, you know, create something different. And I don't know which is better. Um, I remain hopeful that we can change this, the structural deficiencies that we have in the systems because really that to me, it, the rest of it is kind of just like, is is putting out the small brush fires but like really the fundamental change that that i think we need is at a structural societal level capitalism is the best system that we've had in my opinion and has gotten us this far but you know we've seen the way that it can become almost like a cancer on a democratic system i think the perfect example is the citizens united case where corporations became people that could vote with their dollars. And I know we said we wouldn't talk about politics. <clears throat> yeah. But like those are those are fundamental like to me that's a fundamental change that I believe with enough political will amongst even poor people holding signs like you and I, we can change that. Take the money out of politics and let's see what happens. Um, that I I think you're more I I told you I'm an optimist but I think you're more optimistic than I am. <laughs> uh, I I am an optimist but I'm also very pragmatic and I like to be practical. Well, uh, if if you've experienced I, I much hear more, you, I understand a lot of change. A, a lot of change has happened. MLK, Malcolm X, and the Black Lives Matter. Gandhi. Like there has been like people in the, exactly. And the, people have gathered, but every single case, again, goes back to being a thorn in the rich persons or persons in power. Will die. Uh, you will die. You will have to die first, and then it's the uproar of you dying that will create the change. And we've seen this happen over and over and over again. And only that humans were very terrible at, at remembering our history and at repeating ourselves. We keep repeating the same mistakes. So you could, I understand exactly where you're coming from, that there is a fundamental value system at the basis of everything that we're creating that's getting us in this place in the first place. However, those values are being controlled by the people with the money. And you can try to fight the values over here. And uh, if you're powerful enough and you have enough recognition and you die while fighting that, maybe there could be some change. But other than that, we are going to be kind of, you know, beating on the bush and nothing is going to actually change. Um, so the whole idea of, uh, so where should we start? Let's say we started in politics. Let's go change the policies in Washington, D.C., how are you going to do that? Well, you can call and email all your your uh, representatives, or you can even show up at the office. Or maybe you get even a million people of your friends to come to Washington, D.C. with you. We've seen that with gun violence. Nothing is changing. Why? Because someone up here is putting in the money to keep it the way it is. So you either figure out how to play the game and work with, within the game or with the game to change it. And that's kind of, I think, personally, that's how I see we can have a large scale change. Yeah, and I, and I respect that. And I think that's definitely a pragmatic approach. And, and I hope that there is, you know, I think it's accepting that small victories are progress and victories anyways. And so I definitely appreciate that. Um, I don't know. I mean, my, my thinking on this is constantly evolving and I want to believe that we can make structural shifts in our value systems. And, um, and I really believe that, you know, technology 
I saw a presentation recently um, by this gentleman that lives in Thailand. You know, never before have we experienced, or maybe we have a century ago or, or over the course of centuries, but right now we're at such an incredible inflection point in the history of mankind where we have all of this rapid technological progress. And at the same time, never before have we seen the human value systems being shaken to their core in the way that they are being right now. It's the um, scale. It's the yeah. scale of damage. You can do damage so quickly, so fast, and it's hard. So it's hard to rebuild because rebuilding takes a long time, but the damage can happen so fast. <laughs> it's crazy. It's it's absolutely yeah. wild to watch, and I have no idea, and I don't think anyone knows where this is all leading, but it's fascinating times. I guess, Chris, you know, oh, go ahead. No, I think for me, I, I, I the, the biggest component here, everything, like we can dance and play and go this direction or the other direction. Everything goes back to money. Everything, good or bad, goes back to money. So the good, it's a lot of people wanted to create a bunch of wealth. They keep pounding at that so that they can have money in their bank account. The bad, there's war, there's poverty, there's disease, whatever the thing is that we as humans think it's not good for us, there is somebody making money that's perpetrating that thing to continue happening. And it's, it's being able to kind of like think through our capitalist system, to think of capitalism 2.0, if you will. Um, and I think the movement is coming up and people are starting to raise up and say, hey, this greed and accumulation of wealth and individualism uh, is kind of taking us the direction we really don't want to go. And um, in the Bay Area in the past, there used to be these buses that would take people from San Francisco down to Mountain View, where most of the big tech companies are. And each bus, when they started, each bus had a logo of the company. And over time, because of gentrification, because people are making a lot of money down and they're coming to San Francisco and paying a, these exuberant amounts of rent and kicking out the natives, and people start to get angry because they, they are not making that kind of money, but they can't afford to live in the city. So they started literally egging the buses. Like they would throw eggs at the <laughs> buses. Um, and, and then... Change happened. The change happened this way. All the buses that go to Mountain View, you'll be hard pressed to see a bus that has a logo of the company yeah. that is taking the person to down, down south. Now, the reason I bring that up is because there's going to be a metaphorical egging of this rising of saying, I need to accumulate and consolidate and acquire all these companies and become the biggest company in the world because of the inequality people are getting more and more and more feeling pressed uh, because of the inequality and having a giant company and having all this accumulated wealth is not going to be sexy anymore. And when that metaphorical egging happens, then the change in the mindset of how we create capitalistic systems, I think, will happen. Wow. I really, I really appreciate that perspective. And I think we're getting there. I think you know, um, as you said, there's only so much inequality that people are willing to tolerate before the political unrest becomes too much. Um, we see, you know, billionaires signing up to pledge a large percentage of their wealth to donate, um, you know, tax to pay. They want more taxes on the wealthy to create more equality, um, or so they say in public. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that as a, we, we know the system of capitalism works really well, except in the instance of a tragedy of the commons where we, where we privatize the profits and socialize the costs. And I think that that's getting the socialization of costs via climate change and some of these other problems that you're addressing is getting so large scale and so massive that I think we will see a shift. I hope that it's a peaceful transition, um, but we'll, we'll see. I, I don't know. And, Again, you're very optimistic, man. Peace is, uh, it, that's what you would like. That's what you would hope. <laughs> that's <laughs> what I would like. it doesn't necessarily what happens. Uh, and it's, it's humans. Uh, we are very, very bad at history. And never again, always, we tend to forget it. And then it happens. And then we repeat. Uh, it, it's sad, but it is true. So I like to be. I like to be pragmatic and, and prepared and be realistic. <laughs> For sure. I'm, I would like to say that I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, but also prepared. 
Um, and you know, we'll, we'll see, but that's why I'm doing this show, you know, is to, is to speak to people like you, to learn from people like you, to raise awareness for those that are listening. Um, I think we are at a massive inflection point for humanity. Um, I think that, you know, these issues are important to discuss and I really, really, really appreciate you taking the time to come on and chat with me. And I hope that we get to continue to connect and I'd love to get more involved with you, Kat. And um, I'd love to see you, you know, what's next for you? What's next for you, Kat, before you have to jump? Why don't you tell some of the listeners? Oh, yeah, no. So you, Kat, has, uh, uh, we do this annual gathering, which is amazing. Uh, We have uh, very, very interesting people uh, that come through. And um, in uh, October, uh, around 11 through the 13th, We'll have our annual conference, and the way I describe the UCAT conference is for anyone who knows what TED conference is, and anyone mm. who has watched what Black Mirror is, and <laughs> if you imagine those two combined, the conference is what UCAT is. Uh, it's like really bringing people from all walks of life who deeply care about technology and what it's doing to our society and we have these very authentic conversations and think through solutions well i'd love to join um i'd love to come join and chat with you there but uh thanks so much for your time again and i'll post uh links to you Cod, and some of the other work that you've done in the show notes and yeah it's been it's been really great chatting with you brother and i hope that uh we stay connected i appreciate you man thanks for having me Thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed that episode and I hope that you're enjoying the podcast. It's been a really fun ride so far. I just get so excited every time I meet some of these incredible people and just love sharing their stories and and ideas with you all. You can learn more about the show at thelookuppodcast.com. That's T-H-E, lookuppodcast.com. You can follow me on social media at Wark Meinstein, W-A-R-C-M-E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N on both Twitter, Instagram, um, and Medium, and Facebook. Uh, We have a Facebook page for the show as well, The Look Up Podcast um, on Facebook, so check us out. You can also subscribe to our mailing list on the website for more future updates. If there's anything from the show that you want to catch, I've posted that in the show links for you to check out. And if there's any way that I can improve, please let me know. Feel free to reach out. If you have any guest recommendations, please let me know. Other than a couple of individuals who are helping me out in the background, you know, this is a passion project and I'm always open to feedback and any kind of support. I want to thank Sam Palumbo and Patch Kid Music for the sound editing and the intro and outro song that he created. And I want to thank Hello There Collective for their support on my social media. You can check them out at hellotherecollective.com. All right, that's enough for me. I'm sure you're ready to go on to your next activity. Thank you for listening. And please come back again next week for another episode of the Look Up podcast. (laughs) 